I'm very proud to call Joan Kerner a friend, indeed a dear friend. Not only that, she is a great Australian who has spent her life fighting for social justice and the ability of communities to determine their own future. And now, the piece de resistance. We're going to hear from the woman herself, someone who really, as I said before, needs very, very little introduction, the Honourable Joan Kerner. I've still got more to say, because I have to say her name three times, remember? That's Brett's rule. When the conference organisers decided to introduce a social justice oration last year, really, we could think of no better person to name it after than Joan Kerner. A former Premier of Victoria, Joan remains an enduring community activist and champion for equality and inclusion. She has played an integral role in the social development of this state and, in fact, a huge role in the Australian landscape in her work as teacher, advocate, champion for the advancement of women, social justice campaigner, MP, and also, as we heard from the Prime Minister, good friend and mentor to many, many other politicians. And she remains an energetic defender and builder of communities across Australia. Last year's Joan Kerner social justice oration was delivered by former ACTU chef, uh, Chief Sharon Burrow. This year, being potentially the final Communities in Control conference, we thought, why not go right to the source? And so with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Joan Kerner. Thank you, Carol. Can you hear me up the back? Yeah. Just put your hands up like you used to in school. You can't. Good. Um, thank you, Carol, for the generous introduction. And thank you, Prime Minister, commonly known as Julia in our family, uh, for your generous words. It quite brought a tear to my eye, as they say, to see the young woman that uh, I mentored standing there as Prime Minister talking to me as... Well, it sounded a bit like my mum, really. And, and I would like to be. I was planning, actually, on my son marrying her, but that didn't work. Um, I'd like to begin properly by acknowledging the Kulin Nation, elders past and present, and the understanding that the, one, the people I know in Indigenous communities have given to me of this community. And I want to say how absolutely delighted I am to have Kennedy Edwards here. When I sat down next to him uh, yesterday, only yesterday, um, I knew I knew him from somewhere, but I couldn't remember where. Um, and then when I went home last night, my, I said, guess who I sat next to today? And uh, Ron said, who? And he sa I said, Kennedy Edwards. Kennedy Edwards, he said. I taught him at Ballarat Junior Tech. He was in the Ballarat Orphanage. So that's a good thing. One of the good things about this conference, isn't it? You make new friendships, you catch up with old acquaintances, and you get recharged. Well, I don't need recharging on social justice because it's been my passion and my life. But I would like to thank Joe Caddy, Dennis Moriarty and Carol for allowing us to have a conference of ideas and passion where we can refresh our spirits and refresh our actions. And it's great to have Meriburra Neighbourhood Renewal here. I love these people, they're just wonderful. And of course I did not influence the decision. And I hope many more of you apply next year because everyone in this audience could win that award. It's not about the award. It's really about telling the story. Telling the story of how you can recognise what's affecting your life and if you wish to, change it and build on it. So I'd like to acknowledge you, the people of this conference, and thanks for the inspiration. 
I acknowledge uh, in writing this uh, oration the support of our community staff. I don't acknowledge Dennis Moriarty because he made me do it. Um, but I do acknowledge Kathy Davidson and Chris Porthwick. I'm very honoured to follow my friend and colleague Sharon Burrows, President of the International Congress of Trade Unions, in presenting the award. I am also honoured, of course, that Julia introduced it. So you're the future activists, or the current and future activists. I'm very glad this is the last formal conference uh, of our community that I'll have to speak of because I might not be able to get up the stairs tomorrow um, or next time. But I think it's really important we leave this conference clear about what we mean by social justice. And I often use my grandchildren these days uh, as a point of reference. And I'm sure some of you do or use your own children. If your children, grandchildren, or children are anything like my nine-year-old grandson, Joachim, they are pretty clear about social justice. One of his favourite sayings is, Nana, that's not fair. <laughs> and guess what Nana says back? What are you going to do about it? <laughs> and he goes, oh, Nana. <laughs> but it can apply to what something he sees on television, something uh, he sees at school, bullying at school, umpires decisions in football and hockey, of course, or soccer, or to innocent victims of war who he hit, or trade union uh, uh, actions that his father is part of, he often says, that's not fair. So he's pretty clear about the concept. But like a number of us, he's not always so sure what to do about it. And I'm honoured to be here because I know that you people are doing something about it. You do know what to do about it. Not the whole, probably but you're part of it, which of course, as has been said at this conference, adds up to a very large set of actions. And the first thing we need to be clear about, of course, is why we are so passionately committed. What, I what are the principles that stand behind social justice? I can only tell you mine and what I've, what I've read and experienced over the last 40 plus years, but they, they are democracy, mutual respect, human rights, equity, environmental sustainability, and the thing that this conference always emphasizes, community ownership of their own futures. That's why I and some other people in this room have been a participant and a partner since the Whitlam years in developing policies and programs that open up equal opportunity for women and girls, children in disadvantage and remote schools, children and adults with special needs, communities faced with intergenerational disadvantage, but are entitled to live a life that they feel is worthwhile. Over the past 40 years, it's been fantastic to be part of those programs. It was fantastic to work with Auntie Mary Atkinson from Shepparton on the program which enabled Aboriginal children to have their elders coming into the school and working with them so there'd be a mutual respect for cultures. It was fantastic to work with uh, the Labor government in introducing the land care program. It was fantastic to close Kalula. Does anybody remember Kalula? The mental hellhole at Sunbury? Mental asylum hellhole? It's very important in social justice that you feel it in your gut. Jan Kennedy will remember the Kalula issue. And I had a very good minister at the time, Minister of 
politics, that is. Um, Kay Setchers. And we didn't have much money as a government in 1990 to 92, not much spare money. It's very important to decide what was the important thing to do with it. And Kay said to me, I want you to come out and see Kalula. And I thought, I know she's up to something. But out I went. And I saw people scratching holes in the windows so they could see out, because they were all frosted, walking backwards and forwards because there was nowhere else to go, banging their heads on the walls. And the stench that they had to live in, and I was only visiting, made me sick. Kay knew that would happen. No, you can't let that pass. So I felt that in my gut. Nearly lost most of them, I think, at that day. Those people were living in it. Imagine my joy when we eventually closed Kalula, only about six months later, after negotiating with the unions who weren't sure we were doing the right thing, after transferring money from less important things, when we closed it. Later on, about oh, six months later, I went to the Williamstown neighbourhood house, and who should be there? But uh, Maisie from, Daisy, sorry, from, who was now living in the commission houses. And there she was, a free person, able to live a life of respect and actually respect others as her equals. That's what it means to do social justice. But I wasn't the advocate. I was the lucky person who could enable it to happen. So what a privilege it is today to be amongst community activists. And I'm delighted, of course, that you community activists are going to continue the tradition. Two of the facts which underpin my passion for social justice were encapsulated by Professor Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett in the speech they gave here a couple of years ago on the spirit level, their book. And if you haven't read it, they're British professors, do read it. Because they demonstrate something that is key to keeping social justice as part of government policy. They demonstrate this, that the vast majority of the population is harmed by greater inequality not just about the individuals, it's not a welfare issue. It's about what kind of society do we all live in. And they also demonstrate that the effects of inequality are not confined to the least well off. Instead, they affect the whole population. The individual good influences the common good. Joe Hockey, Shadow Federal tre Treasurer, recently suggested that the age of entitlement was dead. For a moment, because I was listening on the radio, I, was, I thought he was saying the age of enlightenment was dead. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that sounds right for Joe. Um, but I realised, oh, that was political, sorry. Um, but he wasn't. <laughs> He wasn't saying that. He was saying the age of entitlement was dead. And frankly, I nearly threw something at the radio. Surely he wasn't suggesting that the strength of our nation's future progress is based on breaking the link that I know and you know exists between economically successful society and what is socially just with social justice obligations. In my view, a society which breaks that link is on the road to social division and economic disintegration and low productivity. It's on the way to what James Whelan so brilliantly described, I thought, yesterday. And we don't want to follow the path that Prime Minister David Cameron has led, us, led UK into. We don't want to redefine the role of the public sector and the community as subservient to the private sector. 
And I'm proud to say that I'm standing here today next to Carol Schwartz, who is a leader in the private sector and the community sector. What she actually demonstrates is what I'm saying. But if you put those things together, then you can, in fact, deliver social justice for the whole community. So let's be clear. We must, we can, and we must afford social and economic justice in Australia if we are to remain a strong and independent country. On the United Nations Human Development Index, we in Australia are, do you know where we are on that list of 187 countries? That's all right, I didn't know till someone did the uh, research for me. We are, we are second, we are second out of 187 countries. That's part of because of good policies, putting a social platform underneath this community. We are just behind Norway and 108, 85 places above the Democratic Republic of Congo. That'll put you to sleep calmly every night. We have the highest median wealth in the world, higher than the US, higher than Japan, higher than Switzerland. And our shadow treasurer talks about not being able to afford entitlements. We have the biggest houses in the world. The average new home here in Australia has gone up in size by a third. 50 square metres in the last 25 years. And you haven't all been having enough children to fill them. So why are we doing that? <laughs> the good news, though, for all of us, is that Australia's median wealth means we don't have to put off national and community action to establish Australia as a social justice beacon, as well as a productive and resource-rich country. But a key question remains. We know we have the wealth. Do we have the will to go further and invest our wealth for the benefit of all Australians? Especially if that requires redistribution of wealth. And I mean we as a community, because if the community has the wealth, has the will, government does take action. Years and years of public advocacy have demonstrated that to me. Not so much if an individual takes action, but an individual can lead and build the movement. And wasn't it wonderful to hear that young man in the last, the last speaker, talking about how to build social action, successful campaigns uh, now. Not in the past as I did, but now. So we can demonstrate where the community investment needs are. We can demonstrate where those businesses and the wealth is being made and where it is being invested for the future. For example, we know that the citizens of Melbourne's wealthy suburbs have a life expectancy of four and a half years more than the citizens in the western suburbs, that is, in the, in the lower income areas. We know that average city dwellers have a longer life expectancy than country folk. We know that Indigenous people have a life expectancy of 17 years less than our national average. That is a shame job. That is a disgrace. So my question for this 10th conference of our community and the last in this format is, guess what? What are we going to do about it? Come on. What are we going to do about it? Not what is the government going to do about it, although they're part of the we. Not that they always see themselves as part of the we. But they are. What are we going to do about it? What are we community, 
community activists are going to do about it? Firstly, I think we have to get rid of some nonsense, some myths. We need to reject the often offered solution of citizen choice in basic services like education and health. That should be public provision, not a choice. Well, public for some and private for those who can pay for it. Frankly, I believe the concept of choice is a load of rubbish. I did have a stronger word, but I crossed it out because this is in print, as a basis for social justice and social and economic pro pro progress. I grew up in the western suburbs like many, and like many local dads, my dad was a fritter and turner. He was lucky. He had a trade. He was out of work during the 1930s depression. He had to ask his dad for a loan to maintain his house payments during the depression. Then dad paid grandpa back, but he never forgot that story. He didn't have the money to make payments on his house or to buy enough food in the house. But he and others like him, and I'm sure some of you relate to this, could have gone on choosing till he was blue in the face. But his children would never have gone to the top private or public schools. Why? Because he didn't have the money to choose. And we weren't in the location to choose. So let's stop deifying choice as the way to move our community towards a social justice space. It's not about choice. It is on moral issues about choice, but not on these crucial public issues of what kind of society do we want. My parents and their friends knew that the only way their children would succeed in education and benefit from climbing the meritocracy ladder and, become, and for me to become a teacher was through our parents advocating, working for and shaping in, and insisting on governments providing a quality public education and health system and be happy to pay their taxes even on a limited income and insist that those who have pay more. In other words, I grew up in a family of community activists with a community view of the world. Unfortunately, I had to go then to a number of fundraising events and I lost count of the number of raffle tickets I helped to sell to build the Essendon Hospital and Aberfeldy Primary School. But they knew then, and we know now, what correlates with prosperity for our nation, indeed all our nations. A quality, free, accessible and participatory public education and training system. Universal employment. How can you be equal if you don't have a paid job if you can work? I see it in the West all the time. I see its impact on the children, naught to six, in my daughter's childcare centre. Universal employment is not just an aim, it's a necessity. And what about an accessible and affordable top quality public health system? Effective chief public transport, a, <coughs> excuse me, a vibrant and inclusive cultural life, ongoing investment in a sustainable environment and ongoing dialogue about a sustainable environment that we can contribute to. I can't stand this debate about uh, climate change. It's as though we're scared of the world changing. Well, for God's sake, the world has always changed. What we have to ensure is that we contribute to making the best of that change. Is that so hard? No, unless you think you're powerless, in which case, I'm very glad you're at this conference, because you'll learn you're not. <laughs> These that I've just listed are the public goods that a society as rich as ours must provide. 
those with wealth, companies and in individuals need to keep generating that wealth. But we also need to realise that the workers and the trade unions are generating the wealth too, as well as the non-paid community activists. We're all generating wealth. We're all entitled to a say on where that wealth goes. We should get a fair return on our investment, all our investments. I get so angry in Australia, the country of the fair go, that the richest 20% have seven times the income of some of the people living in this room. As my grandson would say, that's not fair. And the gap in other well-developed countries like Japan is only about half that ratio. How come? How come we tolerate? How come we tolerate those gaps and those divisions? And the gap, I have to tell you, and I don't want to depress you, is getting larger. During the, uh, gen the great financial crisis, the net worth of the top end of town in Australia went up 15% in four years. The bottom end went up 1% at the same time. So what we know as voters and citizens of the world, that the happiest, most productive countries in the world are those where there's the least gap between highest and lowest income earners. And that's not about what some people call class envy. It's about ensuring the quality of life of all our people in Australia and the world is underpinned and sustained by earned wealth, shared wealth, and wealth which invests in social justice and economic development for all the people. Increasingly in Australia, as the Gonski report demonstrates, we are creating a divided education system, public and private. Just look at the yawning gap between higher and lower school retention rates and VCE scores in well-resourced schools compared with lower uh, state or Catholic schools in lower socioeconomic areas. For the future of our society, we desperately need to invest big bickies in our education so that no child's educational opportunity from childcare to tertiary placement is inhibited by their parents' socioeconomic level. And as I wrote that the other night, I thought, my God, I have been saying that now for 50 years, and I'm still saying it. <clears throat> it would be a lot better if we were all saying it, and I know you are, but the we is essential to making governments listen. And I happen to know that our Prime Minister is committed to that aim. If Australia is to be a socially just country, then in all our policies, from refugees, we can't be proud of that one, to economics, we must recognise the claims of what I simply call common humanity, as well as system and individual obligations, community government and business responsibility. When individuals, communities, government and business recognise and practise common humanity, we can build a productive and progressive nation which can achieve both social justice and economic justice and environmental sustainability and cultural respect. But let's not be naive. I don't make a habit of that, and I hope you don't either. There are interests in our society who want to connect people. There are others who want to divide and distract us from that common purpose of achieving social justice. Tapping into our fear of change or retribution is their most common strategy that 
we might disturb the status quo. Well, it seems to me that's a compliment if you disturb the status quo. Over the last five years, we've made some great gains after 30 years of work on equal pay principles. We're not there yet, but we will get there. But we only started that when we got angry and we got organised in the 1970s. So I'm not encouraging you to be always angry. Occasionally be fine, especially when it deserves it, the action. But for God's sake, get organised. From my lifetime experience of politics and community, I urge you to be very clear when you do get angry and you do get organised, and many of you are, because I know many of you in this room, be clear about your values. That's why our community is so important. They are clear about their values. Carol's clear in business and in a social action on values. And you can recognise them from one day to the next. It's not just what you say, it's what you do. So I've been clear about my values. I didn't write them down until I became Premier, which was a bit late, but anyway. <laughs> I wrote these things down. People matter. Women matter as much as men do, which in my cabinet was pretty important to write down. <laughs> All people deserve to be treated with respect. Treating people res with respect gains respect. People affected by decisions should be part of making them. And equity before the law and in the distribution of resources underpins a successful, socially just and economic productive, economically productive society. So I found that saying those things and then doing them or trying to or explaining why you couldn't at the time maintain the integrity of government. So, like a good teacher, ex-teacher, I'm not sure how good I was, but I was a teacher and I loved it. Your homework <laughs> from this conference, where's your pens? <laughs> oh no, it'll be in the report. Is to restate and recommit to your values. Plan your individual and collective campaigns to strengthen social justice in Australia. And if you've already planned them, well, get on with it. <laughs> Commit to, to personally and collecti collectively ensuring that every child in Australia from north to six and in your local community has a early childhood introduction to what they could be as young people. Ensure we have an education, training and employment system which rewards and provides effective pathways. And for God's sake, get out there and demonstrate against those appalling TAFE cuts. They won't affect... They, they won't affect the recognised trains, trades, they've been left alone, the skills, as they should be, but they will affect the people we work with, the people who need a second chance, the people who people like Matt and others work with. Insist on our collective responsibility to close the gap in income distribution and provision of services, even if it hurts you personally a bit and continue to build an Australian society which is free from violence and respects and enhances our common humanity and our common environment. You people here today, your children, are the future. You can ensure that Australia is a socially just nation. And let me finish with uh, words of one of my idols and mentors, Lillian Holt, who was, who is, I'm sorry, an uh, Aboriginal woman who taught, who's taught me a lot. 
and like a brash young chair of the Centenary of Federation Committee for Paul Keating, I went to Adelaide or I went round Australia with my committee and I s and got to Adelaide last and Lillian was chairing a group. And I've been pretty slow to ask Indigenous people about how they'd like to celebrate Federation because really they didn't have much to celebrate. Wasn't a lot that came for Aboriginal people, not even the vote. You know they know what. Anyway, I figured I know Lillian well enough to ask the question and not be eaten. And so I said to her, well, Lillian, how would Indigenous people celebrate Centrenia Federation? And she said, and some of you have heard this before, well, Joan, I'd celebrate it by talking about racism. And I said, oh, Lillian, Fair go, that's hardly a way to celebrate. And she said, no, no, you misunderstand me. Talking about racism is to create healing. Because well, people will understand that what diminishes me as a black woman diminishes all women. Our challenge, as Lillian said, is to recognise that our task as social justice activists is to enhance humanity. Thank you for what you're doing already to enhance humanity and may, may you accept the challenge to keep doing it. Thank you. Thank you.